On today's episode of Locked On Mets, I was joined by Mets author Brian Wright to go through the Mets' history of general managers as we get ready to enter the Billy Epler era. I also asked Brian, a of course longtime Mets fan, about his take on Noah Syndergaard departing from New York to sign with the Los Angeles Angels. <laughs> On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans who are listening to Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen every day. Locked On Mets is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Now, for the next two shows to close out the week, I was joined by Mets author Brian Wright as we went through a detailed look into the Mets' past when it comes to their general managers. On today's show, we talk about a lot of great names that'll bring a smile to your face or or make you upset, whether that be... Uh, The the one-year wonder of Jim Duquette. We talk a lot about Sandy Alderson, and Brian has some strong takes on how he feels about him. In the first segment, though, before we get into the GM conversation, I asked Brian, of course, a longtime diehard Mets fan, what his take was on Noah Syndergaard departing. So we'll get to that, and then through the rest of this conversation, close out today's show and all of tomorrow's show, we just go through a deep dive, judging general managers in Mets history, starting with the one with the lowest winning percentage ever in George Weiss, all the way up to the GM with the highest winning percentage ever in John Murphy. Anyway, though, before we get to any of that, I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing about the Mets and about baseball at JustBaseball.com. Here's my conversation with Brian Wright. All right, today I am joined by Brian Wright, a Mets author who comes on the show a lot to do Mets history stuff with us for Throwback Thursdays. You can find Brian's book, Mets in Tens, and also Mets All-Time All-Stars. Great reads right now if you are getting towards an offseason, also a potential lockdown. Hey, want to read about Mets history? Check out those books. First off, thank you for joining me again. And also, I want to ask to start things off, how are you feeling that Noah Syndergaard is no longer a New York Met? Um, I feel, I'll feel a lot better if the Mets address, um, the pitching concerns, uh, in the rest of the off season. Um, because I mean, relatively speaking to one year deals, Noah Syndergaard was a risk giving him the qualifying offer, giving him 18 million. Um, you know, most times a one year deal isn't much of a risk, but in his case, it was knowing that he only pitched what two innings in two years. Um, so I was fine that they gave him the qualifying offer i like a lot of us thought he would take it um just kind of hinted at that i mean even hinted that he said it said that he wanted to come back um so i was surprised when he he took a greater offer and a greater offer for one year with the angels um but i'm not uh, i'm not disappointed in the sense i'm not disappointed that he is the Mets couldn't keep him. I'm disappointed that he isn't on the team. Um, I just liked him being there. It was, I think, a lot of fans uh, miss or will are disappointed by the Noah Syndergaard kind of the brand not being with the Mets more so than Noah Syndergaard, um, the pitcher. Who, I mean, to that his last full year and he had an ERA over four um, wasn't particularly consistent. Um, 2018 he had some injuries. Uh, 2017 he had a, he had an injury in April I believe um, that took him out for the season and 2016 was his last really great season and of course we remember uh, 2015 at, in his rookie year um, taking the Mets to the World Series or helping take the Mets to the World Series and winning their only World Series game um, with that opening pitch um, you know that opening high and tight pitch um, so I, yeah I mean I'm, I'm 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 I will miss him um I wished I, I was hoping he would come back um but for the rate that the Angels gave him uh and the fact that the Angels are giving up a second round pick to the Mets um I'm not terribly concerned so far as if as long as the Mets you know field a full rotation for next year and it's let's face it it's not like it's not like the Mets are losing someone who was in their rotation last year 
I mean, Otis Syndergaard would have been an addition um, to what they had last year, but it would have been a nice addition, but the Mets are, should be able to, to, to replace that in the sense of just his, his presence and what production he could have given. Yeah. I think that with Noah Syndergaard, like you said, it is interesting you mentioned the brand of Noah Syndergaard. I think I, what, what hurts, I think for fans right now is for one, the way he pleaded to, to be a Matt and, we always love the homegrown guys. I mean, technically he was traded for, but traded for as a prospect. Yeah. And, you know, when, when you see someone come up as Thor 2015, the great year he had 2016, I mean, you look at the numbers, just a ridiculous season. I, I think that everyone was not prepared for this breakup to happen now. We were expecting it next year. And mm-hmm. so I think that's why it hurts for fans. Uh, just putting his, his, his greatness into context of Mets history. I mean, uh, there's uh, obviously so many great pitchers in Mets history, his run a lot shorter, but are we still talking about top 10, top 15 pitcher? In Mets? I, I'm, I'm just off the top of your head. I'm just wondering if you could think like, like how, how will he stack up? Is it just a career, like another one where injuries kind of robbed you of what was supposed to be a really promising, you know, part of your team for a long time? Yeah, definitely not top 10. I think the Mets uh, with their wealth of, of, great pitching over, you know, 60 years, um, have enough that have not only produced well, but produced well for a good, a long period of time, um, you know, as far as their Mets career is concerned. So I would never think about Noah Syndergaard as a top 10 Mets pitcher. Um, 15, I don't, I'd have to think about this a little harder, um, but that might be a stretch. So um, yeah, I mean, he was good for a brief period of time. It was always more the, what he could do. Um, And I think that's still the case. Like, I think he has still has a lot of upside um, provided he stays healthy, which is a, a major if. Um, And I think, so yeah, I think it's always been like what he could do. Like, Oh, if Noah Syndergaard is healthy, here's what he could provide to the Mets. Um, Not, that's not saying he hasn't, he didn't provide a great deal. As we said, 2015, 2016 was a great season. Um, 2019, he was healthy the whole year, which was at least a positive um, and had his great moments. So, um, yeah, I, I think in, we're only going to look back. We're going to look back at what could have been for Noah Syndergaard more than but what he did. What's really interesting is uh, probably a future episode of Locked On Mets, to be honest, is if you think back, like Zach Wheeler, Matt Harvey, Noah Syndergaard, and off the top of my head, I'd say all of them are basically two-year runs. I mean, for Harvey, it was mm-hmm. like 2013, 20. 2015, yeah. uh, you know, Zach Wheeler, 2018, 2019, I guess a little bit of 2014 was good, but all of them, it's kind of two, two and a half years uh, out of the six years of control that you had that, that, that vaunted, uh, you know, generation K 2.0, I guess now we can say, right. It's basically just a Grom was the only thing that, that ultimately proved to be a, a pitcher that had staying power. The one guy who wasn't a first round pick yeah. or a top prospect you traded for. It's crazy. He, yeah, no, Jacob DeGrom is the one guy who was really not part of, you know, in 2013 or in 2012, 2013, 2014, he was not the person you were talking about when it came to the Mets future rotation. You were, you never brought him up un, until, you know, the, you know, until he was there in 2014 and said, oh, maybe he is uh, someone we can rely on in the future. And, you know, it, he is the outlier. I mean, he is the one that's, has that sustained excellence and knock on wood, it'll be for, for a little bit longer. Yeah, hopefully. I think it's a, a very sad thing to think about of DeGrom having an opt out. <laughs> You're just like, mm-hmm. all right, let's get this franchise in order. Let's keep them because that's just going to be devastating if that happens. And bet online is back and better than ever. Now featuring a new web interface for the start of the basketball season with more props, odds and lines available than ever before. Bet online remains your number one spot. For all the basketball and football action this season, head to the new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit just by using our promo code Locked On. From basketball to football, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. With that, let's move into uh, general manager talk. I wanted to have you on to go through the history of GMs and Mets history. Billy Epler becomes, I guess, the, the 16th, 17th. It's hard to keep track after 
the fiasco of last season with Jared Porter and Zach Scott, but he is less than the 20th GM in Mets history. I can say that with confidence. And we're going to go through this list here. I, I basically ranked all these guys based on winning percentage. We'll, we'll touch on each one as we go through it. And it begins at the beginning for the worst GM in Mets history, although it's not necessarily his fault. When you take over an expansion team, George Weiss. Yeah. Woof. Look at this record. 260 and 547. Five losing seasons, a 322 winning percentage. Not his fault, though, right? No, not at all. And I think you could associate, uh, you could give the same distinction to Casey Stengel, who is uh, his manager for most of the time there, um, that it was just he was the he was there during those early years and he really couldn't help much. Um, but George Weiss you know, was a former, was like Stengel, was with the Yankees, um, was there in you know the four, late 40s and throughout the 50s and when they won all those world championships. So he's a guy who knew New York very, very well and um, you know made sure to bring in uh, players that had National League and, and in some cases New York experience, you know, Gil Hodges and and uh, 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 Duke Snyder later. Um, so that was, the, you know, that was kind of his role was to kind of not necessarily build a winning team, but build a team that fans would go and see uh, and maybe, you know, eventually get a winner. And obviously fans came out and, and saw the Mets as bad as they might have been. Um, as far as like the farm system, I mean, I'm thinking of players that came in under his reign. I mean, Cleon Jones, Ed Cranepool, um, Tug McGraw, I believe, might have in, in 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 the late latter part of his time there. Um, but yeah, if you just look at the record, you're just going, "Oh my goodness," you know. But it's that was just the case in the early days of the Mets uh, that you were kind of just uh, a victim of 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 losing teams and an expansion team that in that regard. Well, he did build a fan base, so uh, hats off to George Weiss. And, I mean, I guess maybe it's his fault that a lot of us are in this situation as Mets fans. Uh, then we got Al Harrison, I believe is how you say it. Yeah. Am I right about that? Uh, yeah, Al Harrison. I, yeah. I don't think we have to spend too much time on him. You know, a year, 364 winning percentage, a nice 59 and 103 season, unless you have some antidote you want to you wanna say about Al Oh, uh, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to go back and think about this. Um, he may have had some kind of uh, quote and I'd have to look this up. Um, but, but he, he is um, notable in the fact that he built the team that became, you know, the worst team money could buy. He took over for Frank Cashin, um, who we'll get to later um, and tried to make a big splash after the disappointing year in 1991 um, signed Bobby Bonilla signed Eddie Murray, uh, acquired Brett Saberhagen. Um, I think this was after this. Yeah, Vince Coleman was earlier. Um, so it made a lot of moves to try. He tried. To, yeah, <laughs> he did try. It, it all blew up in his face. And it did. It just, it was, a, as you said, a one and done um, season for him. And he falls just below uh, the successor to George Weiss, which is Bing Divine. Mm-hmm. Never heard of him. <laughs> Never heard of him. But I, I, I was interested to find out that we had a, a Bing as the GM not back Bing, in 1967 yeah. when my not dad Bing, was two years old. Yeah, not Bing Crosby. Yeah, it's only the Bing I know of. Um, yeah, Bing Divine, I believe, was with the Cardinals before. That's that's how I. It's what I think. I think he was with the Cardinals when they won the World Series um, in '64. I could be wrong on that one, but I know he was with the Cardinals. Um, I guess his. <sighs> His big um, acquisition, if you call it that, was Tom Seaver, um, because wow. I believe because I believe Seaver because he was there in '67. I I I, I want it. I I don't know if I'm miscrediting him. <laughs> with, with I mean, at the end of the day, that was the lotto ball. That that, that was that yeah. Tom so Seaver. how much credit can you give someone for it? it uh, basically, a name being pulled out of the hat that was Tom Seaver. I guess he had the foresight to, uh, if it was in fact his call, to put their their name in the hat, so to speak. It's kind of like crediting like Dan Gilbert or the GM of the Cavaliers for drafting LeBron James. It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good job. I guess guess the the difference was like, you had to give a certain amount of money. If he was uh, dumb enough, he could have said, no, 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 I'm not going to do it. That's Tom Seaver. What is he going to amount to? Um, So I guess that will give him if, again, if it is his responsibility, give him credit. Um, (laughs) But I'm looking him up. He draft, he did draft Jerry Kuzman and Nolan Ryan. So we got to give him credit there. All right. Well, I mean, all right. Bing gets a little more credit than I was giving him. Um, then we get to uh, Joe McDonald. 
1975 to 1979, only two winning seasons out of five, 361 record, 449, or 361 and 449, a 445 winning percentage. Actually, I I got this out, out of order here. Jim Duquette, a little bit worse. Now that I'm looking it. at it. Jim Duquette, 438 winning percentage in his lone season in 2004. But we'll start with Joe McDonald. Yeah, we'll start the we'll start with Joe and Joe McDonald. And I, the only thing, the really the main thing I associate with him is the Tom Seaver trade. I really don't remember anything else. Um, when I when I, when someone mentions him mentions him, I immediately go to Tom Seaver. And I, he was kind of an in between um, in the Tom Seaver trade because it was mostly an M. Donald Grant, Tom Seaver tug of war, and Joe McDonald just had to pull the trigger. Um, and unfortunately, pulled the tr- he, he he pulled the lever for a trade, um, which is you know will live in infamy. Uh, but that's really what I remember. I know he was with the Mets for a while. In fact, he may have been on the staff or the front office in 1969 uh, when the Mets won. Um, but pretty much it's down. It came down to one move. Pretty much, you know, and it was Tom Seaver forcing himself out. It wasn't like Joe McDowell decided to make a trade. It was kind of had his you know, his hand dealt to him. Yeah. Well, you know, at a certain point as a GM, if Tom Seaver tells you that he wants to be a trader, someone tells you to trade Tom Seaver, you say, fire me or (laughs) I will not trade Tom Seaver. I'll I'll play Joe McDonald's as well. Uh, Jim Duquette. I think we see him uh, enough on SNY. We know what Jim Duquette's about. Uh, You know, he was essentially an interim GM for a season is essentially the way I would look at that one. Um, yeah, yeah, he was. No, sorry, I was, I was actually going to comment on Jim Duquette post uh, Steve Phillips, I guess, after Steve Phillips was fired. So maybe I, gave Piazza the contract, maybe 2004. No, no, that's way after Piazza. I'm way off. No, there. no. Um, that was all Steve Phillips. Yeah, I'm trying to. Well, I mean, the one. Okay, if he was there 2004, I mean, he, that he would have done the um, the the Scott Casimir trade. There you go. <laughs> 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 there you go. What was yeah. that? Scott Casimir for what? Is that the one that got bet? No, it's Zambrano. Yeah, Victor Zambrano. Zambrano. Victor Zambrano. Um, he was the guy uh, that uh, Rick Peterson, the pitching coach, said he could. I believe it was. Rick, I believe it was Rick Peterson. Well, it was Rick Peterson who said it? But I believe he said it about Victor Zambrano. I, it, I think it was him. He said he could fix him in a week, or maybe <laughs> that could be Alvar Perez. I you don't get. I mean, don't quote me on that one. But oh, um, man. anyway, yeah. Victor Zambrano, what I remember about him, um, it, it, trust me, it did not turn out well. But 2006, he was in the rotation. And there was a game in a game at Shea Stadium against Atlanta in like May, early May, threw a pitch, ran off the field because he was hurt. And I never saw him again. <laughs> There's his Mets tenure. That's his, that to me is his Mets tenure in one cap encapsulized in one moment because the rest I don't remember. Victor Zambrano and Chris Benson, what was supposed to be. Um, yeah, 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 I guess you could say he made not only the Scott Kasner trade, but the trade for Chris Benson when the Mets were, I think they were like three games out of the division um, with like heading into a weekend series against the Braves, a season, a year in which the Annalise was not particularly competitive um, or not, no one was running away with it. And the Mets were like at 500 and three games out. And he's yeah. like, oh, let's go for it. Which you know, hey, the, it worked for the Braves in in twenty twenty one. So yeah. maybe we shouldn't uh, criticize it so much. But he made those uh, Duquette did made those desperate moves for uh, trading away Casimir for Zambrano, and uh, I forget who they traded away for 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 Chris Benson. But anyway, it, it, it turned out that weekend they lost three straight to the Braves. Were six games out, and the rest is the rest was was history. Sad Matt's lore. Uh, next on our list here, we got. Gary, Gary Hunsicker, um, 91, 92, 149, 174 record, 461 winning percentage. They were just they're cycling guys in and out at this point, I right? I don't even – I've heard that name, but I don't even know who's a G. I mean, he might have taken over for Frank Cashin when Frank Cashin was about to retire. Yes, I know yes Cashin, that, is, that is what he did. He took over for Cashin. Yeah, so I've – I, I got, I got, I got nothing on on him. Um, Tough act to follow for yeah. sure. Um, <laughs> we got Zach Scott coming in at a four seventy five winner winning percentage. Uh, I don't know how many of those losses when he was out after the DUI. You credit to Zach Scott or not, but whatever. Uh, I think we all want to forget the Zach Scott era at this point and move forward to Billy Epler. 
But the person who's in charge of hiring Billy Epler, who's still involved with the Mets, Sandy Alderson comes next on our list here. 2011, 2019, technically his eight year run as a GM. Are we going to extend that out to what's happening now? I don't know. But as a GM, a 628, 668 uh, record, 484 winning percentage, two winning seasons out of eight 2015, 2016, World Series wild card. Yeah. I think we've talked. I think we could talk about Sandy all day, but <laughs> what are your thoughts about Sandy Alderson right now? Honestly, right now, um, is a lot different than, than it was. Um, I had, you know, great respect for Sandy Alderson coming in. I thought that, that was a great decision. Um, this is, you know, going back to 2010. Um, and you know, look, he was, you know, was there for in 2015 and when they made the world series 2016 when they, uh we're the wild card team um so got to give him credit for that um when steve cohen came on board and he brought sandy alderson along i thought that was a fantastic move um because i think i'm not saying steve cohen wouldn't got the team without sandy alderson but it really helped make the sale happen um so for that i think was it was a, a good decision um based on what we've seen since and the reports that have happened since um uh my tune on sandy alderson has changed dramatically um i will (laughs) try to be brief in my uh um uh, disappointment uh with sandy alderson and try not to get enraged because it is a point of 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 anger for me because you know sandy has presided as we found out over an organization that is 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 was and to extent some extent is still toxic um, he was, you know, he had, there were two employees, um, one of them named Newman. I'm forgetting his first name, David Newman. I'm trying to remember. And another individual, um, there was an athletic report that came out that both, um, had, were accused of sexual harassment. I believe it was Newman who was hired back by Sandy, um, in spite of those allegations and with some of those employees, I think stay still there. So, you know, and that report came out this April. And Sandy made a comment basically dismissing or dismissing the, the, the nature of those actions. And to me, that's when I, that's when he uh, officially lost my support. And regardless of what happened has happened since, whether or not he still has the acumen, whether or not he wants to be involved and, and can do the job. And, you know, I don't know whatever help he gets from his son and what have you, it doesn't matter to me. To me, you presided over a toxic organization and you didn't learn anything. You didn't take any accountability for it. You, you know, you went after Trevor Bauer and I'm, you know, I'm not saying he should have known what Trevor Bauer was going to do, but you knew he was kind of a weirdo and you went after, and, you know, you hired Jared Porter. I'm not saying you should have known what happened to Jared Porter, but you should admit some fault in the vetting process. And that hasn't happened. And I'm not saying you should know what you should have taken accountability for Zach Scott, but it, it just, and the lack of communication with regards to the Jacob deGrom injury, it just, you know, I, I, I beyond had enough of him. And, yeah. and, it, and I think, you know, and if there's also some lack of communication with Noah Syndergaard, which I might've heard today, it just continues my feelings on, you know, the last vestiges of the Wilpon era are still around. And, you know, I want to believe that he's not going to be involved. And I hope with Billy Epler, an experienced general manager, he won't. Um, I was afraid that if a younger executive came in, that he would be involved and that, you know, presumed Alderson sandwich would have existed. Uh, It still might. Um, but you know, he can, with actions and words can say, I'm not going to be involved, but until he's fully out of the picture, I'm not going to fully believe him. Yeah, no, I think that's all just a, a great encapsulation of what this Alderson era has been. And, and, you know, Brody Van Wagen, and we'll talk about him in a second here. He he's kind of mixed in the middle, but it, it's all Will Pond leading. And I do think that, that Jeff Will Pond certainly takes a, a big brunt of responsibility. And I, I think Alderson in those early years, I had sympathy for him as sort of being 
the one that was supposed to make the Mets respectable when everything around him wasn't. And mm-hmm. but then now, as we have learned more, and he is still, you know, let's be honest, what is he in his seventies? And it's just it feels like he's out of touch. And, you know, you didn't even mention Mickey Calloway in there as well. Another yeah. hire. It's just been a just calamity of errors over the past, particularly the past ever since 2016, really. Um, yeah. And I, I, we don't even know all the stuff that was going on behind the scenes before that. So I, I think yeah. Yeah. we're all ready to turn the page on the Sandy Alderson era and move on to hopefully something better under Billy Epler and, you know, the pipe dream of yeah. David Stearns yeah. is still yeah. back. <laughs> oh yeah, I can't even get prepared for that. Um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right about. I forgot even to mention Mickey. That's how many issues there have been. You know, I would be willing to give someone a pass on, say, not fully vetting a Mickey Callaway, which I think speaks to a bigger problem in baseball with regards to um, sexual harassment and 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 whatnot. Um, but you know, you could. I would be willing to give a, give him a, a pass. I say that. I don't say that, you know, I say that loosely. Um, but when you have this pattern with Jared Porter, Zach Scott, I mean, Zach Scott's a different case, of course, with DWI and not having, but in just these issues around the organization. Uh, and then you had the, the the two employees who had sexual harassment reports, one of which you rehired. Um, then I don't give you a pass. Then I, and th- then there's something with you and it's it's to me it's again I, whatever Sandy Alderson does Sandy Alderson could trade for Mike Trout tomorrow I don't if if he wants to it wouldn't matter to me it's it goes back to maintaining a toxic work environment that has cr- perpetuated I don't know if it's perpetuated t- uh, individuals not wanting to come want uh, you know general manager candidates not wanting to come to the Mets I don't know um, I do believe that Sandy Alderson's involvement the Alderson involvement is a reason also with the obsession with David Stearns potentially and a GM not, not being able to have uh, the ability to work um, under that position for at least a year has something to do with it. But I, I, you know, as I said, Sandy Alderson doesn't matter what he does from now on to me, if the Mets really wanted to change their ways, clean house, start it turn a new page i don't know use whatever use whatever cliche you want to use it's not going to fully happen until everybody that came from that past regime is no longer with this regime yeah no it's it's 100 percent true that the mets have to turn the page to something new um it's tough because if you're not getting people who are interested it, it's hard to rebuild a front office mm-hmm. that quickly and and again it's it's like we're all basically hanging on this dream of David Stearns and without it, you're left with just a a lot of, of pessimism. So naturally I would like to turn the page to Joe McIlvain, just, (laughs) just awkward transition to Joe McIlvain. How did he get into this conversation? 1994 to 1997, uh, 283 and 298 record 487 winning percentage, one winning season out of four. You remember Jim McElvain? Because I don't. <laughs> I, I do. I do remember him uh, when I was a kid when he was the GM. And, and all I knew was just his name and I didn't know his past. And and he was with the um, with the Mets in the in the 80s. He was there. Um, he uh, I think past 86, he kind of became more involved in terms of uh, GM or, or, or high ranking decisions. Um, along with it was Cash and Harrison and McElvain was kind of like the three headed a uh, three-headed monster usually with cash and being the fi- having the final say. So McIlvain had that kind of assistant GM experience um, that you would think would lead to being a GM. Um, but it, you know, I, he also got dealt with a ballot bad hand. I mean, it was a team that had really fallen, <laughs> fallen into, you know, into uh, Mets. Yeah. Typical Mets. Yeah. Well, <laughs> even more worse. I mean, they were the worst team in 93 and um they just fell into disarray and he tried to make it up with the draft picks that you had mentioned generation K I and mean, he was credited with drafting all those three pitching prospects of, you know, Paul Wilson, number one pick in 94, um, Pulse, Bill Pulse for Jason Isringhausen. Um, and it just didn't work out. I mean, it's really, I don't know how much, I mean, it's not really his fault that it didn't work out, but um, it's, that's, that was under his, his regime. And um, I'm thinking of other, 
other deals he might have done. I mean, the one deal I think he he was he presided over was the trading of Jeff Kent to Cleveland for uh, Carlos Baerga. I think there were other, there, like, uh, Jose Vizcaino. They also traded away and they got um, Alfaro Espinosa, I also believe. But Kent for Baerga was kind of what what everyone remembers. And Baerga turned out to be a bust, and Jeff Kent uh, turned out to be a the, you know the most productive home run hitting second baseman in history. <laughs> crazy oh all these guys got at least one bad trade on their resume don't they um i mean hey that's kind of the nature of the business but uh i wonder if we explored a different team if if they would have as many uh, misses uh, on their collective resumes that's gonna be all for today's edition of locked on mats as i said we're gonna pick up this conversation on tomorrow's show a lot of interesting stuff when it comes to the mets history with gms and it was a great conversation with brian wright Thank you again to him. You can follow him on Twitter at BrianWright86. Find his books, Mets Intense and Mets All-Time All-Stars. Really great reads. I encourage all of you to check those out. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, check out the Locked On Bets podcast. Hosted by your boy Q and handicapping expert Lee Sterling. Locked on bets is the best place to go for your daily gambling needs. You can follow locked on bets wherever you get podcasts.